Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies, gentlemen. Um, no need to adjust your screens or there's nothing wrong with your eyesight. I am not the IOM DDG. Laura Thompson, our DDG, is unfortunately unable to attend the session today, so I have the pleasure to be the moderator of this session this morning. My name is Jacqueline Wekers. I'm the uh, Migration Health Director at uh, IOM here in Geneva. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to this session on the role of women in the COVID-19 response and recovery. After having discussed yesterday the implications of the pandemic for migration and its future and the protection challenges arising for the most vulnerable populations, Today, we will start with a discussion on the role of women in the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. While there is evidence that the, rate, that the death rate among infected individuals is higher for men than for women, the impacts of the pandemic appear to be exacerbated for women and girls across every sector from health to the economy, from security to social protection, and further amplified in context of fragility, conflict, and emergencies. Nevertheless, women are not only vulnerable. They, are, they have been the driving force behind the health efforts worldwide, with many of the health workers and other personnel taking care of sick people, being often migrant women. Building on previous discussions on the key role of migrant women at the IDM and in other fora, this panel will invite key perspectives from governments, UN organizations, and youth organizations on the implica implications of the pandemic for women and girls, the challenges they are exposed to, but also on their stories of empowerment and contribution to the response and recovery efforts. During this panel, we will also learn the conclusions and recommendations of the side event organized ahead of this IDM by IOM, UN partners, and member states on the importance of ensuring universal health coverage for all migrant women and girls. During the next two hours, we will try to address some of the following questions. Which particular vulnerabilities has COVID revealed or exacerbated for migrant women and girls? How can we include better young migrant women and girls in the recovery efforts from both the perspective of addressing their challenges, but also from the perspective of considering their skills and contribution to health and socioeconomic responses? The essential role that women are playing in the response and recovery, not only as frontline healthcare workers, but, but also other essential workers, must be emphasized. With the importance of migrant healthcare workers around the world that has been highlighted with the pandemic, how can governments better ensure protection for these individuals and their vulnerabilities? I would like to invite the speakers present with me on the podium as well as those uh, connected online from various parts of the world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and you all, to share views, challenges, and best practices in promoting immediate responses and for longer-term recovery efforts that consider not only the specific vulnerabilities of migrant women and girls, but also their strengths and skills. I would like to now start uh, introducing the panelists. We have uh, five panelists this morning. Um, uh, Kitlan Kabua, Ministry of Education, Sports and Training, Republic of Marshall Islands. Maya Morsby, President of the National Council of Women in Egypt. Susanna Jacob, Deputy Director uh, General WHO. Christine Lowe, Director UN Women Liaison Office in Geneva. And Maria Corina Muscustoro, UN Major Group for Children and Youth and Co-Founder and Director of Venezu uh, Venezolanas Globales. Um, okay. Um, let's start with the first speaker, and uh, I have the pleasure to welcome today Her Excellency Kitlan Kabwa, Minister of Education, Sports and Training, Republic of Marshall Islands, one of the ten elected ministers in the presidential cabinet. 
Her Excellency is the youngest MP elected at the age of 28 and is one of two females in the predominantly male parliament. From August 2018 until her recent election, Ms. Cabra worked as the EBEI project representative of, on phase two of the World Bank funded Pacific Resilience Program a series of projects to strengthen Pacific Island countries' resilience to natural disaster and climate change. IRAM has a long-standing partnership and collaboration with the Ministry, and this includes over seven years of working to implement the CADRE, which is the Climate Change Adaption and Disaster Risk Reduction Education Project. This includes hands-on locally developed curriculum with students, support to the schools to develop school emergency management plans and work with the communities of the schools to establish disaster committees to organize trainings on the cadre curriculum, also human trafficking and other topics. I'm glad to welcome you to this session, uh, Ms. Kabwa, and I appreciate very much your willingness to, gain, uh, to join this discussion at such late hour in your day. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Sorry, she's actually not my, 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 my MRC is on my page. She's actually stuck on the other screen. Excuse Just me. Just go, go, go on my MRC. Sorry, I just heard that our first speaker is not yet online. So I'm very sorry about this. Um, I will right away move on to introduce the second speaker, who will now be the first speaker. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Maya Morsi, President of Egypt's National Council for Women, since her election in 2016 as the third and the youngest president since the council was established in 2000. Dr. Morsi was awarded the Woman of the Decade in Public Life and Empowerment in 2018 and the National Award of one of the 100 most influential women in Egypt in 2016. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak in the Arab Republic of Egypt, Dr. Moya Morsi was activated, has activated sorry, the National Council for Women and played a vital role in unfolding concrete plans aimed at ensuring women's protection against the socio-economic and psychological repercussions of the pandemic in the country. <clears throat> the Council Recovery Response and Social Protection Measures have been supported by IOM Egypt since the early stages of implementation. And in addition, IOM Egypt was nominated in June 2020, co-chair of the UN Women Results Group with UN Women. Welcome, Dr. Morsby, and we look forward to hearing from you on the role of Egyptian and migrant women in the fight against the pandemic, including the consequences on their life and how the government supported them. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And um, uh, thank you very much for having women as a core uh, and an important pillar in your discussion. Uh, Egypt's rapid uh, response on women's situation during COVID has, has uh, specific uh, steps that we have been taking. Since uh, the 30th of March, Egypt has launched the first globally uh, concept note or policy note on uh, the response measures to the situation. And this was at, at that time, we did not have any guidance, we did not have international measures, and everyone was uh, in, in studying, uh, learning and studying. But with the political will in Egypt, presidential political will, we had the direction to, to have to see and to study where women would uh, be affected, how we can support them from the beginning of the pandemic, and how we can protect them on the long run uh, as well. And the new normal to be studied in, in, uh, with effect to women. Egypt has also uh, launched the policy tracker uh, with the government, and we had uh, done several edition, iterations, and the fourth uh, iteration was uh, launched in uh, 30th of June. Why we said this? Because if we have a, co a policy note, we have a policy tracker, we have guidance on the interventions with the government, this would help the government to take the right decision. And um, uh, also on international level, Egypt had led the process of developing and submitting a draft resolution with Algeria, China, Saudi Arabia, Zambia, entitled, entitled Strengthening National and International Rapid Response to the Impact of COVID on Women and Girls under Agenda Item 126, the Global Health Foreign Policy to the General Assembly. We tried to work nationally and we try to help as well on international level. Migrant women were, were, and refugees were 
core and part and parcel of all the policies that were designed from the schooling, health system, awareness raising, outreach, social protection, and violence against women. The National Council for Women is the official national women machinery of Egypt as, as, uh, and is the policy uh, platform also for the direction. Why we were very important, the policy uh, political will was insisting on having something uh, related to women because we have 73% of nursing staff, uh, in the, including the private sector, uh, are women. 42% uh, of human doctors are women, 91% nursing staff and 56% uh, of female employment in the service and in the health service and 18.1% of women heads of household. And as uh, you know, also we have around uh, reaching almost 6 million refugees and migrants in Egypt. So with all this, uh, it was very important to have a clear direction. The affected segments uh, in Egypt were women at reproductive age, women in, with immune disease or chronic disease, elderly women, women in, in need, migrant workers, refugees, women with disabilities, women with health conditions, pregnant, lactating, and women in, in, in fragile and informal sector workers, domestic workers, street vendors, and women at orphanage and elderly uh, shelters. The pillars of the uh, policy uh, directory or the policy note has four main pillars, impact on human endowments, which focus on health, education, social protection, uh, or scaling up social protection, safe delivery, psychological support, irregular workers, and violence against women shelters. The Women Voice and Agency was focusing on violence against women, leadership and representation in decision making and designing uh, the policies. The third pillar was impact on economic opportunities, the midterm economic interventions, and the support uh, on the uh, short, uh, medium, uh, short, medium, and long term with the financial inclusion, teleworking, part time uh, digitalization, and referral pathways. And last uh, in the pillars were, was promoting data and knowledge with research, surveys, and um, the tracker, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with also uh, social innovation, monitoring, evaluation, and public surveys. Um, the policy tracker has uh, identified around 106 policies, measures, and decisions taken by the government of Egypt throughout the period from the beginning of the pandemic to the uh, 30th of, of June, ar from around 300. So around one third of the measures taken by the government are gender sensitive, women specific, or gender responsive. Uh, uh, on the other side, when the UNDP and the UN Women Global track Tracker had uh, studied the work of Egypt and the policy tracker, they clustered the decisions and they find 38 measures with 21% uh, with 21 measures specific to women. And Egypt was the first in the uh, um, uh, Middle East and the Asia, uh, Western Asia uh, to be on the top of uh, the countries uh, responding to women uh, demands with a holistic response and with measures related to major three dimensions, which is social protection, labor market, physical and economic policies, and uh, violence against women. Um, the, the, uh, the measures um, had several uh, directions from exceptional leave for mothers, family planning, chronic dis uh, disease uh, medicine, delivered uh, and support to their to the homes measures for nursing homes and shelters con, uh, con, uh, conditional cash transfer uh, that was upscaled increased monthly income for rural women as well allowance for medical staff has increased 500 uh, cash allowances for irregular women workers around 40 percent uh, in the database uh, ncw in ir irregular workers as well or informal uh, sector has been uh, given a conditional cash transfer uh, exceptional soft loans were given to women, uh, reduce and postpone microfinance uh, installments and funds, uh, more funds to support microfinance uh, projects. Basic food supplies were delivered to uh, the COVID-19 uh, positive protocol to people in need, especially uh, elderly, sick and um, uh, uh, disabled. Uh, there is there established a psychological support hotlines and awareness raising and social stigma because it was hard in the beginning mental health online programs were also offered 
migrant and refugees, um, women are within the health programs of Egypt with no discrimination. We offer medical assistance benefits to migrants and like the Egyptians exactly. Electronic and financial services were also provided. Egypt, uh, there was an application on health uh, support and um, digitalized financial uh, inclusion and uh, training. Uh, with the violence against women, uh, every country in the world expected an increase. We had conducted a survey to measure the uh, impact of the COVID on women. Uh, around, we discovered that there is around 7% uh, that women affected or increased in the violence. Uh, that was never, uh, um, they were never, uh, uh, they did never experience it before. And this was uh, the uh, alert, but the whole percentage was around 11%. So 4% used to have violence cases, but 7% never had violence cases and it started in COVID. Uh, the harmful traditional practices also was on our uh, uh, radar screen, like female genotype mutilation, early marriage, dropout from schools, especially when the schools went, went online. We were afraid that girls will be the first to be dropping out. But thanks God, when schools are starting now, we're finding that this was not highly effective. Um, also, we continued in de delivering the free ID cards for women and uh, women, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, early detection of breast cancer and the health of Egyptian women at large. Egypt has, as I mentioned, Egypt has close to 6 million migrants. We live together. We in, in, impose no restrictions on movement. We call them our guests. We don't call them uh, migrants or refugees. They are for uh, Egyptian women. They are our guests. Uh, our Vi Violence Against Women uh, Complaints Office, which is also supported by our IOM, uh, provides equal treatment to migrants. We provide legal support, legal aid, and um, uh, migrant or refugees uh, as, as the service is as Egyptians. For health system, as I said, we have equal uh, treatment. And um, we. Uh, what was marvelous as well, although there is uh, a, 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 an economic challenge at large, we found that migrant workers inside with the families in Egypt, they prefer to stay with the families rather than going uh, uh, to their homes uh, to, to be protected fully from uh, the COVID and they felt as a family as a whole. And we have a lot of stories documenting this as well. Egypt provi provides training opportunities to refugees on handicrafts and the, the council is responsible on this and also providing the marketing of their products. The violence against women shelters are avail available for women survivors from violence, uh, also open for uh, the migrants and the refugees. And we cannot uh, deny that the impact of the COVID-19 is economically is challenging the whole world. And we're trying as much as possible that women would be uh, minimally um, uh, uh, affected, but also uh, supported. Uh, as, as I mentioned, Egypt uh, got the first uh, uh, degree on, in the gender response uh, tracker, the UN tracker, and we are determined as well to work on the gender accelerator, closing the gender accel gap accelerator with the World Economic Forum and with the COVID-19 as a, a main uh, pillar with the Ministry of International uh, Cooperation. Um, the, the promoting of data and knowledge and statistics and research is ongoing because as much as we learn, we are designing the better policies to, res to respond to the women needs at large in Egypt, Egyptians, refugees and migrants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morsi. This was a very, very interesting uh, presentation on the, the efforts of uh, the government uh, of Egypt and the policy tracker you mentioned. I think over, over 100, I think 106 policies and measures that have been taken. It's really impressive. Uh, you also uh, clearly mentioned the important role of, of women. Uh, you, I think it was over 90%, 91% of nursing staff in the Ministry of Health are actually uh, women. Um, what I also found interesting you underlined this is an international response your international collaboration you highlighted it very well and as well as some of the vulnerabilities like uh, violence against migrant women as well as the important uh, measures that were taken to empower women and they were very multi-sectoral from uh, food uh, supplies to mental health to infrastructure projects housing and so on um, thank you very much. I turn to the governing bodies. I would like to know if we have an update on um, 
um, uh, Minister Kit Langkabwa. Still not online? Okay. Then with further, without further ado, I would like to go to the third speaker. And uh, if you all agree, we would like to keep the questions until after all the speakers have uh, uh, delivered their interventions. Uh, I would like to now um, introduce uh, Dr. Susanne Jakob, no? um, present here today. She's the Deputy Director General at WHO since 2019. Previously WHO Regional Director for Europe, Dr. Jakob has held a number of high profile national and international public health policy positions in the last three decades, including as the founding director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Stockholm, Sweden. IOM has worked in close collaboration with WHO for decades, including in the current response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Together, we are key partners in the WHO Global Action Plan for promoting health of migrants and refugees. As coordinator and secretary of the UN Network on Migration, IOM is also honored to count on WHO as a key UN system partner to ensure greater coherence in migration and health policies. Dr. Jakob, thank you very much for having accepted to join us today. Welcome, and you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm very pleased to contribute to this international dialogue on migration, uh, on the role of women in COVID-19 response, and very important role that women will play in the recovery from the COVID-19. I consider this as a very significant event, and I'd like to start by thanking IOM for organizing it. Uh, and today in the panel discussions, we will be, we will be focusing on COVID-19's implications on migrant women and the recognition of migrant women's contribution to the prevention, response, and recovery efforts from COVID-19. Let me first say that WHO has had a long and very successful history of working closely together with IOM. And I would like to send greetings to your Director General Jacqueline, Antonio Vittorini from our Director General, Dr. Tedros, who regrets that he cannot be with us today. And special thanks to you also, Jacqueline Wheeler, for the excellent and long-standing collaboration that we had with you over the years. Together with IOM and other partners, we have drawn the attention of the political leaders to migrants' heightened vulnerabilities, on, and also particularly the vulnerabilities of women and children. And during the pandemic, of course, this was absolutely visible. But we have also drawn their attention to the fact that women and children have had a significant contribution both to COVID-19 response, but also to the future of the socioeconomic recovery. Today in my introduction, I was thinking to introduce uh, two issues, partly to talk about the role of women um, and migrant women in particular in the pandemic and in the recovery phase, and then in the second part to address the issue of how WHO is addressing these topics. So let me first review the role of women who are the driving force behind the health efforts worldwide and their contribution to the recovery will also be crucial. Whilst migrant women may have higher vulnerabilities in health terms, they also have been the driving force behind health and healthcare efforts worldwide. As we heard it from Maya Morsi, the president of the National Council for Women in Egypt, who gave us a very excellent summary of what is going on in Egypt and what are the figures in Egypt. We can also confirm that in the global health system, global healthcare systems, women make up some 70% of the global health workforce, and therefore they are highly exposed to the COVID-19 also as patients, and also to the patients in COVID-19. Recent data have shown 
that if you look at the total healthcare workers who were infected by COVID-19, and you look particularly at data that came recently from Spain and Italy, you have seen that 72% as well as 66% respectively were women who were infected among the healthcare workers. So therefore, we have to address very significantly the high morbidity and mortality risks associated with migrants who are employed in the frontline services, in the first line services during the COVID-19. We also need to ensure that all frontline workers, including women, migrant health and social workers and caregivers, they have equitable access to training, to PPE, and other essential products, to psychosocial support and social protection at the same level as the other nationals. So due to the fact that they are vulnerable, they have to have access to all the services as all the others, and even at a higher level because of the high infection rate. Regarding vulnerabilities, Women, particularly migrant women, most often bear the brunt of a dual burden of poor health and well-being and inadequate access to services. They may experience inequities and poor access to information, health promotion, prevention and care services, and social and financial protection. And increased stigma and discrimination are also occurring and can hamper effective response. During the COVID-19 pandemic, stay-at-home messages have affected livelihoods, women's care burdens have increased, their access to necessities have been reduced, and their social and protective networks diminished with increased amounts of household stress. Due to the tensions that were generated by the pandemic and movement restrictions, a sharp increase in domestic violence and intimate partner violence was also observed. As health systems of most countries have been stretched by the pandemic and priorities had to be reconsidered, staff had to be reprofiled, services had to be reprofiled, because of the overwhelming demands and supply chains were also broken and therefore essential health services, including sexual and reproductive health services, pregnancy care, contraceptives, sexual and gender-based violence services and family planning have been disrupted. This has negatively impacted the already limited access to these services for migrant women. So let me come now to the second issue, how is WHO addressing the vulnerability of women, including migrant women, in the response to pandemic, and what do we consider as the most important tasks? So first of all, at one level, the key is universal health coverage, which means access to services and financial protection, to which WHO and all the partners, and actually the whole world, is absolutely committed. We need to promote health systems that are people-centered, inclusive, and gender-sensitive. But we have learned a lot on this issue during the pandemic. We have learned that we have to go much further to make the health systems more resilient. We have to improve the preparedness. We have to improve primary health care, and we have to improve the access to essential public health services, which should be made global public goods. And I like to underline the fact that we have to strengthen primary health care at all levels. And in all this, as women are such an important part of the global health workforce, as I said at the beginning, 70%, they will have a crucial role in all this uh, move towards more resilience and in all this move towards uh, recovery. 
equitable and non-discriminatory non access to health and protection services for migrants during COVID-19 response is crucial. All member states have an obligation to protect and to promote the right to health of all people, including migrants, and all migrants, regardless of their legal status, have the right to access healthcare services, such as testing, diagnostics, care and treatment, and referral, as well as prevention and health promotion related activities for COVID-19. Good health monitoring and data are also needed to understand the health needs and to set priorities that integrate migrant care into the overall health system. And only 40% of the globally reported confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported to WHO with age and sex disaggregation. And it is not due to the fact that countries don't want to report, but these data are not available. So therefore, we have to invest a lot into this to make sure that data is available and data is aggregated according to age and sex. Then we also need to do more on the research front. We need to conduct a gender analysis of data and invest in quality gender responsive research on the potentially differential adverse health, social and economic impact of COVID-19 on women and men. The findings of such analysis should be used to fine-tune response policies. In this regard, WHO is conducting a survey, which is called Apart Together, to better understand the impacts of COVID-19 in refugee and migrant populations, and the outcomes will be presented in December this year. Equitable access to sexual and reproductive health services and gender-based violence must be included in the essential packages of services responding to the pandemic. The predominant role of women in response to and recovery from COVID-19 should be recognized and promoted, particularly concerning their caring role, for example, as health workers. And I would like to conclude by recognizing that the, that the pandemic exacerbates existing inequities in health systems capacities. We must leave no migrants, women and children behind in our public health responses to the pandemic using an inclusive approach that respects the human rights. And finally, their role in the recovery will be crucial and we have to think jointly with the member states in the upcoming period on what are the lessons that we have learned from the COVID on the impact of health services and how we can further improve the resilience of health services. And in this, uh, women and migrant women, uh, including, have to be part and parcel of the thinking and brainstorming process. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you, colleagues. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yaka, for this uh, WHO perspective, which uh, uh, very clearly showed the incredible um, participation of women in the global health workforce, some 70 percent, and also some important facts on mortality and, and, and morbidity. Um, you also very clearly uh, highlighted how it will be imperative that all people, also all migrants, and especially the most vulnerable, such as women and girls, have equitable access to essential uh, primary health care services, as well as equitable access to COVID-19 tools. Um, of course, uh, failing them will mean we fail public health. It's not only a human rights issue, it's also really a public health issue. Um, you also very clearly underlined how universal health coverage, we all remember the UN General Assembly and the UHC declaration of last year is actually our key vehicle to, to move forward uh, into the right direction. Uh, very important you highlighted the need for data. 
and um, the work, and of course your joint work with member states. Uh, we look forward to your to the outcomes in December of the Apart Together survey. And uh, with further ado, I would like to move again to our governing bodies uh, colleagues to hear if there's any news from the first speaker. No, unfortunately. Then um, let's move on. Um, to our fourth speaker. Hold on. Also present in the room today, I'd like to introduce um, the, our distinguished uh, fourth speaker, Ms. Christine Lowe, Director of the UN Women Office in Geneva since 2017. Hello, good morning. Before joining UN Women, Ms. Lowe served as a diplomat in the Swiss Foreign Service for 12 years at the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in Bern and the permanent mission of Switzerland to the UN in New York. IOM counts on UN women as a partner addressing the needs and positive potential of the millions of migrant women and girls around the world. Earlier this week, we jointly hosted an informal virtual dialogue on the importance of ensuring universal health coverage for women, migrant women and girls in the context of COVID-19, together with uh, Luxembourg, Mexico and the Philippines, as well as UNFPA, UNICEF and WHO. And Christine will also share some insights from that discussion with us. I have a pleasure to have, uh, uh, a pleasure to have you here with us today, and the floor is yours, Christine. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. And let me, thank, uh, let me start by thanking IOM um, for organizing this year's International Dialogue for Migration under these very difficult circumstances, and for inviting you and women to participate in this panel discussion on the role of women in the COVID-19 response and recovery. The current year 2020 is marking a confluence of important anniversaries also pertaining to gender equality, women's empowerment and their human rights. Notably the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, 20 years since the groundbreaking UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, the 75th anniversary of the UN and the 10th anniversary of UN Women, my own organization. For this year, 2020 was originally imagined as a year dedicated to reflection, celebration and renewed commitment to gender equality, women's empowerment and women's human rights, celebrated at the UN as well as the Generation Equality Forum in France and Mexico area, uh, earlier this year. These conferences have been moved to next year. But so this year still presents an opportunity for the global community to take stock on the progress achieved and charge a course of action to tackle the areas in which significant challenges remain, including the full realization of migrant women's human rights. However, as we have heard, the COVID-19 pandemic and its staggering impact have radically altered the context in, in which we are observing these milestones. This year has instead seen inequalities further exacerbated and the limited gains of the past decades since the adoption of the Beijing Declaration at risk of being rolled back. Women in migration have been particularly affected by these worsening inequalities because of the systemic discrimination they face on the basis of their race, national origin, migration status, and other factors. These repercussions, therefore, of COVID-19, therefore, have been severe. Not only are migrant women more likely to be exposed to the virus owing to the nature of their work, but they face more adverse economic impacts, generally earning less, saving less, and holding more insecure jobs. Millions of migrant women have been working on the front, front lines during the pandemic. We heard it as healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and millions more have been playing other, um, other critical yet oftentimes invisible roles as care workers, cleaners, laundry workers, grocery clerks. Due to the nature of their jobs, many migrant women have not been able to work remotely, facing a heightened risk of exposure to the virus. Globally, as a result of the lockdown measures, there has been a shocking rise in cases of violence against women. 
This is the so-called shadow pandemic. Migrant women are obviously affected, but for women migrant domestic workers, the risks are greater still. For those who were unable to return home, they were for forced to remain locked in with the employers, leading to a rise in cases of labor rights violations and abuse. Recognizing the issues facing migrant women during the COVID-19 pandemic is important, but finding practical solutions is really critical. So three days ago, Jacqueline just mentioned it, IOM and UN Women co-organized um, a side event, an informal dialogue on COVID-19, the importance of ensuring universal health coverage for all migrant women and girls. At this event, governance, UN agencies such as UNFPA, WHO and UNICEF and civil society presented concrete measures and, concrete and good practices on integrating migrant women into response and recovery plans while ensuring the promotion and protection of their rights. Multi-stakeholder partnerships, including with migrant women and their organizations, were identified as being an essential feature of response and recovery measures. While the pandemic is a global crisis, many of the resultant impacts need to be addressed by community groups, such as migrant women's organizations at the local level. The importance of working with community leaders to address xenophobic abuse and prevent migrants from being blamed for the spread of coronavirus was recognized as an important step to support migrants' integration and improve their access to services. The event also underlined the importance of universal health coverage for all. During this current crisis, it has become very clear how vital it is that essential services to prevent and respond to gender-based violence are accessible even during lockdowns. These essential services to address gender-based violence should be free at the point of use and should include treating physical injuries as well as providing psychosocial care. Speakers further highlighted in the event the urgent need for awareness raising about violence against women and reinforcing complaints, uh, complaints mechanisms as essential tools for addressing this atrocious shadow pandemic. The detention of migrants should only ever be a measure of last resorts. Migrants who have not committed any criminal act should not remain detained during a global health crisis because detention centers are not equipped with sufficient hygiene facilities and the implementation of distancing measures is almost impossible. Providing community-based alternatives must be prioritized for migrant women who are survivors of violence, pregnant migrants, and those who identify as LGBTIQ. The economic impact of this pandemic has, have been severe for so many people, for migrant women who are some of the furthest behind as they are concentrated in low paying and unregulated sectors, these impacts have been dire. Response measures that ensure migrant women have access to social security would provide a critical lifeline. But because of their migration stat status, too many women and their families remain excluded from social security. Coordinated action based on stakeholder solidarity is crucial to build back better and differently from COVID-19. Through the Generation Equality Forum that we are organizing in the context of the, um, of the Beijing Plus 25 anniversary, together with the co-hosts France and Mexico in close partnership with civil society, including women's, um, migrant women's organization, we are working to foster such solidarity. The forum is mobilizing gender equality advocates from governments to grassroots organizations, private sector to youth activists, and to take action and undo the reversals that we have witnessed as the pandemic has unfolded. Throughout the coming months and until summer 2021, we are mobilizing a movement for urgent tr transformative change that places the voices and needs of marginalized and grassroots communities, such as women in migration, at its heart 
and foster solidarity-based partnerships around the priorities and challenges that the COVID-19 crisis poses to the, these communities that have been disproportionately affected. By doing so, we can work to build a more just and equal world as we emerge from COVID-19. In conclusion, let me recognize that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused great uncertainty, displacement and adversity, exposing huge disparities and inequalities across the world. But rather than seeking to go back to business as usual, we must make every effort to bridge these rifts and create more equal and inclusive societies, affording migrant women and girls the same treatment as nationals in social economic recovery plan. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for this, uh, this great uh, intervention and uh, reminding us about very important vehicles, not only UHC that we just heard about, but also the Beijing platform. Um, uh, you also, uh, as previous speakers, uh, underlined uh, that uh, inequalities have been further exacerbated by COVID-19 and uh, that uh, migrant women and girls unfortunately face many obstacles in accessing uh, essential services due to their migration status and uh, lack exclusion and, and exclusion of for, uh, from social protection. Yet they're more exposed to all sorts of risks, including health risks and violence, interrupted care, substandard living conditions, and so on. Um, thank you for underlining the invisible work and contributions of, of women. And uh, I also think it was uh, very nice to hear your, your summary of the uh, session that we had earlier this week that, that amplified the need, that, that we now see an amplified need for whole of society and whole of government approach uh, to address the structural obstacles and inequality faced by migrant women and the need for protection from experiencing, of course, vulnerable situations and their own role their own role in uh, bringing change and the community-based uh, engagements. I'm going to stop here because we can continue forever on this very important topic. I'd uh, like to know uh, if we have any more news. No? Okay, then let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, let me see. That will be possibly our last speaker then, I think. We'll right? see yeah, okay. Uh, so allow me to welcome to this panel a video message from Maria Corina Muscus Toro, member of the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. Maria Corina is a Venezuelan migrant and women's rights activist. She is a lawyer from the Universidad Católica Andrés Bello and holds a master's degree in international legal studies at the American University Washington College of Law, where she specialized in human rights and gender. She's the co-founder and director of uh, Venezolanas Globales, a platform that gathers and connects women from the Venezuelan diaspora. The UN Major Group for <coughs> Children and Youth is a partner of the IOM in promoting the perspective and the role of youth in the debate on migration and migration governance efforts. The group was a key contributor to IDM 2019 on youth and migration, and as well as an active participant in previous IDM sessions. We very much look forward to its contribution to the session, and we regret not to have Maria Corina with us online uh, because of the time difference, but I'm certain that her video message will enrich our discussion today. Um, let's start with the video message. Good day, everyone. I would like to thank the International Organization for Migration for this invitation. My name is Maria Corina Muscus. I am a Venezuelan a woman and a migrant. I come here today representing the United Nations Major Group on Children and Youth Migration Focal Point as a board member in gender, and also as director of Venezolanas Globales, the first and largest network that gathers and connects Venezuelan migrant women. I want to begin my remarks by telling you a story. Felimar Luque is a doctor, a Venezuelan gyne gynecologist that migrated to Peru. Her dreams to keep performing her duties as a doctor were shattered once in Lima. 
where she sold arepas, Venezuelan typical food, in a street market with her sister. For more than a year, she dreamed of pursuing her profession, and what was a terrible crisis for some became an important opportunity for her. As a consequence of the COVID-19 crisis and the lack of health professional, she is now working in the most important social security hospital in Peru. This is a great example to let us understand the importance of social and economic inclusion of young migrants. States can accomplish much when they let migrants regularize and use their skills to benefit the community and their host country. Migrants are not a burden but an added value to the society's development. When discussing the pandemic and the solutions to COVID-19 crisis, it is not only important to consider a gender perspective, but to understand the impacts of migrant women are different as they experience inequality and discrimination in diverse ways. According to the recent IOM World Migration Report 2020, migrant women, women represent around 74% percent of the service industry and their vulnerabilities during the crisis not only includes gender-based violence but also xenophobic rejection graded insecurity against the virus an overload of care work and increased gender-based violence as migrant women do not have sufficient support and network in the specific case of migrant girls imagine what this means According to the Malala Fund recent report, around 20 million more secondary school girls could be out of school after the COVID-19 crisis has passed. States must recognize structural discrimination and the challenges that a person faces if they're young, but also a migrant and a woman or a girl. We, migrant women and girls, as mentioned before, face particular vulnerabilities. And it's important to address our needs when developing public policies and during decision-making processes, it's important to listen to our needs. In the particular case of health services, there are difficulties for migrants and refugees. As mentioned by Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on Migrants, Felipe González Morales, and on trafficking in persons, Maria Grazia Jan Marignaro, States should also take steps toward regularization of undocumented migrants whenever necessary, in view of facilitating their access to health services during the fights against the pandemic. Therefore, it's important to grant migrant access to health and health care regardless of their status, and in particular, young women and girls need to continue to have access to sexual and reproductive rights despite the COVID-19 crisis. It is important to recognize our vulnerabilities, but, it's, but also know that migrant women are agents of change. For example, in Venezolanas Globales, the platform that I coordinate that gathers and empowers women from the Venezuelan diaspora. In the beginning, we were just a few Venezuelan women connected on a Facebook group. Two years later, we are a community of more than 2,000 Venezuelans and 19 ambassadors in more than 14 cities in the world that organize meetings and discussions with women from the diaspora. This community understands the need to adapt to a new country. That is why we run up sessions about personal development and professional skills. Even though we are migrating due to a terrible, complex humanitarian crisis, we also like to be recognized as agents of change and migrants that provide an added value to the local community. This dialogue is called Reimagining the World of Migrants and Human Mobility for the Achievement of the Sustainable Developing Goals. In that sense, it is important that we support women and girls-led and youth-led initiative, include women and girls, especially migrants, in decision-making processes, make sure that when creating a response to the pandemic, migrants have affordable and effective health care and education. We should not need a pandemic to realize that cases of migrant women such as Felimar can contribute to the host country. States shall ensure that the skills and qualifications of migrant women are recognized and create a logic and reasonable pathways to integrate us socially and economically so that we can provide our talent and knowledge in order to contribute to the host country. Thank you very much. Well, it's too bad you're not here, Maria Karina. It was a very uh, 
very good uh, statement. I really congratulations. Uh, it was an excellent example um, of um, the importance of socioeconomic inclusion of young migrants and to use their skills to enhance the development of, of their community, seeing migrant uh, women as um, agents of change. Um, I don't think we have news from the first speaker. No, okay. Um, thank you very much for the speakers. Uh, your interventions were incredibly rich. I will definitely not try to summarize them at this moment, uh, but I would like to open the floor for uh, questions as well as comments and interventions from, from member states and I understand, uh, uh, and, and partners of course, and I understand there may also be uh, some of the speakers or interveners or interventions from um, the chat box. Uh, for now I have a list, I see the Holy See asked to have the floor, followed by um, some, oh, a range of other speakers actually from PAM, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, as well as a range of uh, member states. I'll start with the Holy See. No? Okay. We'll move on to... The Holy See, yes. Holy See, yes. Okay, okay, I see. Yes. Sorry, sir, I didn't no. see you. Thank okay. you, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, as the world continues to be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, the crisis is ch changing our way of life, calling into question our economic, health, and social systems, and exposing our human fragility. COVID-19 also has further exacerbated the challenges and risks faced by women and girls. This remains a global concern that hinders the full exercise of the unique and irreplaceable role of women, and their results as negative consequences not only for women themselves, but also for their families, communities, and our societies at large. Um, the vulnerability faced by women is nonetheless met with extraordinary resilience. Even during these challenging times, women have shown their strength and taken on key roles in promoting the well-being of society as a whole. Indeed, many women, including migrant women, are at the front line of their responses to COVID-19. Among them, the Holy See wishes to stress the invaluable contribution of many unsung religious sisters engaged in humanitarian activities. They give their time and service to the benefit of the most vulnerable, tending to the sick in these challenging times, often in places where states cannot reach and where there are no alternatives. Uh, Madam Moderator, everyone should feel safe and secure in their homes. And therefore, it is deeply regrettable that during the lockdowns, uh, there have been a, an upsurge in domestic violence and abuse. As pointed out by Pope Francis, every act of violence committed against a human being is a wound in, human, in humanity's flesh. Every violent death diminishes us as a people. We must break this cycle, which seems inescapable, unfortunately. In this regard, this delegation urges that the pandemic becomes a wake-up call to strengthen the invaluable role of women in society. Uh, in light of the challenges and risks faced by women and girls today, uh, aggravated by the pandemic, we would like to ask the panelists two questions. First, <clears throat> how can we amplify women's voices in the recovery phase of the pandemic for a more equitable and healthier future? And the second question, what practical measures and best practices can be shared to help prevent domestic violence? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Sorry, I'm still writing. Uh, thank you very much. These are very important questions. Uh, uh, can I say yes, I take several questions before I turn to the panelists for the answers. Um, I would like to introduce the next intervention by the Parliamentary Assembly of Mediterranean. Are you online? Online. online? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Excellencies, it is my ex sincere pleasure to address you on behalf of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean at this very important session of the International Dialogue on Migration. In the last month, the COVID 19 pandemic has disproportionately exposed all of us 
in particular vulnerable groups and women who are at the front line. Women account for 70% of the health and social care workforce, but hold only 25% senior roles. The crisis further exacerbated pre-existing gender inequalities and women and girls overrepresented in informal and unstable employment face multiple forms of discrimination and domestic violence. While cases of violence have been increasing, some health services to victims and domestic violence have been unfunded, restricted or prohibited to comply with reallocation of health-based services to fighting the pandemic while judiciary systems have been suspended. Women who are migrants, refugees, part of the LGBTQ community or have disabilities go disproportionately underserved as they have especially vulnerable to gender-based violence in particularly during their, their, their journey. They also face discrimination against social and legal services, often facing language and cultural barriers, stigma from the police, as well as permanent fear of detention and deportation. During the pandemic, our assembly urged its member countries to include women and girls in both emergency measures and long-term responses to the COVID-19 pandemic as a key principle to ensure the recovery of more sustainable, resilient, and equal societies that leave no one behind. In such a context, it has to be our great concern to support women irrespective of their migratory status and to ensure the implementation of anti-discrimination policies as well as alternative form of providing services which will effectively meet every woman's need. At PAM, we are convinced that this crisis could be turned in a great opportunity to strengthen girls' and women's rights and gender-based equality. But we need a comprehensive response, which includes women as a target population as well as a driving force. Promoting gender-responsive budgeting as a COVID-19 response governance tool, expanding opportunities for women-owned and women-led businesses to access markets are some concrete responsive proposals. In the longer term, it is important to develop a comprehensive response to tackle gender inequality and gender-based violence. In this regard, I wish to share with you some policy recommendations by the PAM Task Force on gender equality. First, we have to develop and adopt policies addressing structural inequalities such as the labor markets to promote women to decision-making positions. Ensuring that the same definition of domestic violence is applied across international, national, regional, and local legal systems and criminalizing domestic violence is equally important. Parliamentarians play a key role in adopting adequate legislation and allocating enough resources to the most effective services. However, we can only address the challenges if we work together, adjust policies from different levels of government and adapt a multi-sectoral approach. Putting women and girls in the COVID-19 responses will accelerate progress towards a more inclusive recovery and help build more equal and sustainable economies. In line with this strategy, we are really proud to participate and contribute today to this important meeting, and we shall build on the results and follow up with our national delegations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pam, for this very important uh, statement. Uh, um, I would like to take a few more comments or questions uh, from the floor. Next one, uh, the government of Phil Philippines. Yes, you have your... Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'd like to recall that the Philippines uh, very happily joined the co-sponsors of that side event that was earlier mentioned and use this occasion to express our appreciation to Mexico, the IOM, UN Women, WHO, UNFPA, UNICEF, and Women in Migration Network for bringing to the fore this important subject of ensuring universal health care coverage for all migrant women. The Philippine migrant workforce is heavily feminized many working in the domestic and healthcare sectors, often dismissed by some as the 3D jobs, dirty, demeaning, and dangerous. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed these services, however, to also be essential. Many prone 
to being exposed to the violence and situations of risk inherent in their nature of employment. We have also seen how economies and communities relied on migrants in the health workforce and domestic care services throughout this crisis, despite lockdowns and other restrictions. One in six doctors across OECD countries studied abroad. In the last decade, the number of foreign-born doctors and nurses in developed regions grew by 20%. Migrants, Filipinos among them, make up 12% of the 1.9 million strong UK health force and 17% of the 12.4 million strong US health force, as an example. While working to ensure that our own demands for a domestic health workforce is not impaired, we are fully aligned with the global code of practice on the international recruitment of health personnel. Our bilateral agreement with Germany, for example, on the recruitment of nurses has remained active throughout this period. At the very least, the pandemic has demonstrated how positively migrants, women migrants in particular, can contribute to societies when they are able to participate in them fully and actively to the maximum of their skills and abilities. In this regard, we must also consider, at some point, how women migrant workers can contribute to what will eventually emerge as the new normal. In this regard, I am very happy to refer to a joint statement by several UN agencies, including the WHO, just released yesterday, calling for renewed commitment to global solidarity. Permit me to read a section of that joint statement. Particular attention must be paid to the situation of women who are overrepresented in low-paid jobs and care roles. Different forms of support are key, including cash transfers, child allowances, and healthy school meals, shelter and food relief initiatives, support for employment retention and recovery, and financial relief for businesses, including micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. The last is very important because in many developing countries, women are the ones who are handling the mom-and-pop stores that service so many of the peoples of those countries. And many of those stores are sustained by remittances from family members overseas. As a point of hope and encouragement, that statement also says, and I would like to take this as uh, my concluding point, it says, we are committed to pooling our expertise and experience to support countries in their crisis response measures and efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The extent to which this applies or should apply to migrant work workers and migrant women in particular is something that we in Geneva and elsewhere, all the agencies and interested states within the framework of the GCM and elsewhere should be able to bring our minds together and move forward. Because it is no secret that during the pandemic, we have not seen a diminution of uh, stigmatization and scapegoating, of exploitation and exclusion. We must work better, we must build better, and we must come back stronger, as has been said. Thank you. Thank you very much for this strong statement and underlining the disproportionate risk of many uh, migrant uh, women workers and yet we all recognize the importance of their work as well as the WHO Code of International Recruitment and the role of remittances and our own roles in uh, responding. Um, the next speaker on the, my list is from Tunisia. I'm not sure if the speaker is in the room. Yes, the floor is yours and please try to keep your statements to two, three minutes maximum. Thanks. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to thank uh, all the panelists for the wealth of information shared uh, around this uh, common theme. In other words, the contribution of uh, women to the COVID-19 response. Uh, we want to highlight that uh, vulnerable and marginalized populations were those that were hardest hit by the pandemic. And uh, that is why, from the beginning, we have joined uh, the appeal of the Secretary General of the United Nations to leave no one behind. We would like at this stage to emphasize the importance that uh, Tunisia gives to uh, the economic independence and the active participation of women in uh, political life. Uh, 
Uh, we also want to promote the gender equality and eradicate all forms of discrimination against women. Just uh, for an example, the rate of uh, women doctors in my country is about 50%. Uh, those who have uh, uh, pharmacy degrees, six, 72%. Uh, and nurses, uh, it's almost 64%. In some regions, paramedical staff uh, is mostly female and sometimes reaching a ratio of 80%, whereas medical staff is more or less uh, uh, got parity. All this to say that uh, women uh, is uh, at the heart of the fight against the pandemic. Uh, however, several cases of gender violence have occurred over the sanitary crisis in my country and elsewhere. Yes, women, uh, under confinement has seen their workload increase, uh, especially when they are part of the sectors that have continued to work uh, in person or even remotely with, uh, or together with an important uh, domestic workload. We should also emphasize that uh, intra-family violence has also been on the increase. This affects uh, particularly women and uh, children. This uh, has been exacerbated among those who are more vulnerable, weaker, and many of them uh, are also part of a precarious and informal work sector. To face this, uh, my country has uh, set up uh, forward-looking legislation to eradicate violence uh, against women, and we have set up institutional mechanisms uh, to protect women and to prevent violence. Several initiatives have been carried out to uh, raise awareness uh, and to provide better follow-up of uh, women that are victims uh, of violence uh, or discrimination. This is done hand-in-hand -hand with uh, civil society organizations. Uh, regarding legal protection, uh, last April, the Superior Council um, of the Judiciary ordered family judges uh, to take all necessary measures to better protect uh, victims, to guarantee their access to justice, uh, and to fight against violence against women and children uh, as uh, a vulnerable uh, social subgroup, especially uh, in times of pandemic. Uh, similarly, special treatment uh, is given to women uh, that are incarcerated. We shouldn't lose sight of them. Uh, that way they could also access uh, health care services, and that way they can also stay in touch with their families. Madam Chair. We are facing together one of the most violent crises and one of the more devastating crises that has shown in a short space of time our collective weakness, but also the great divide or the great divides rather between women, between men and women as a collective. This is a threat. It threatens peace and security at a global level, which is why Tunisia supported the initiative as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for 2020-2021, and it has allowed for the adoption on the 1st of July last of Resolution 2532 on COVID-19. This historic resolution recognized the role that women have in the fight against COVID-19 and made an appeal to minimize the impact of the pandemic on all vulnerable categories, especially in conflict areas uh, and obviously uh, women and girls. Uh, it is essential that the international community uh, persevere in their solidarity. We need to mobilize all resources available. What is at stake uh, is uh, our health and our future. Thank you very much for this call for solidarity. Um, I'd like to invite the Global Policy Insights. I think there are two speakers uh, who would like to take the floor. Online? Yes, good morning uh, from New York, New York. On behalf of Global Policy Insights, I would like to thank the IOM, this panel, all distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to speak and represent my organization at this event. 
I am excited as the female representative for my organization to contribute to this dialogue, this very important dialogue on gender inclusion. Migrant women are more at risk and disproportionately affected more than ever, and therefore closing the gender gap has never been more essential in building back better and beyond. Women are also the first to feel the effects of any natural, economic, or health disaster, and for migrant women and girls, these effects are felt all the more. Cases of domestic violence increase. Girls are discouraged from receiving an education or it becomes unsafe for them to travel to school. And financial support for small business and domestic migrant women owners is low to none. Young women and children have played an invaluable role in the COVID response and recovery, but on the whole, they have higher vulnerability in the areas of health, education, and business integration. As the dominant gender in the healthcare services, they have been at a higher risk of exposure and infection, yet still receive lower income than their male counterparts. Women are also disadvantaged when it comes to receiving their own health care and mental health services. These situations are aggravated for migrant women as they increasingly are discriminated against by both their country of residence and even their countries of origin. For migrant domestic women workers, the pain is greater still as labor rights have been violated and in many cases, incidents of domestic violence have starkly increased. In addition to being disadvantaged in affording low and high technology uh, resources for quality education, migrant girls are often discriminated against and the first to feel the effects of disasters as education is taken away. For many migrant girls, education is an important channel for physical and mental growth, yet schools are rarely a safe space for infrastructural, transportation, and health reasons. We must do better to provide clean water and sanitation at schools for gender-specific health and hygiene services so that their reproductive rights are not violated and do not become a cause for education disruption. We must also create safer means of commuting to school, providing bicycles, safer road conditions, or a consistent and reliable public transportation system to and from schools so that migrant girls have the security to travel to school and receive an education. Finally, we must partner with teachers and families to emphasize the inclusion of migrant girls in the education system. Finally, migrant women can help shape international and local policy as agents of change. Migrant women contribute to human and economic capital and have historically contributed holistic, intersectional, and multilateral development solutions that have helped advance important equality initiatives and in facilitating peace and security. We must do better to integrate migrant women into the economic mobility and provide formal employment and financial security to this community. Furthermore, we must also partner with the private sector and education sector to provide migrant women and young entrepreneurs the socioeconomic and entrepreneurial skill sets to afford women the chance to contribute as human and economic capital in the workforce of COVID recovery and beyond, especially in these most vulnerable populations. Holding governments to universal health care coverage, inclusive and gender specific regular uh, health services and access to public health services at all levels is essential. Gender mainstreaming and gender oriented public policies, programs and work initiatives must be implemented at all levels by multi stakeholders, the governments and the private sector. Criminalizing violence against migrant women and children and labor exploitation must also be put into effect. Equal access to education and job opportunities for higher education for women and creating safer education conditions for girls not limited to transportation infrastructure and gender specific amenities. Migrant women and children have been most vulnerable during COVID. And if we do not take the onus upon ourselves to mobilize and improve conditions for these communities, we are dangerously at risk of not only continuing to increase gender-based disparities, but also leave an entire demographic of invaluable human capital and individuals behind. The contributions of migrant women and girls can help foster community partnerships, increase our economic development, shape policy, recover better and safer, and build back better, and they must be included in this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there's a second speaker of the Global Policy Insights, I had heard there were two. If not, then I would like to move to the next speaker from a member state, uh, Mexico, in the room. Many thanks, Jacqueline. I also want to thank the panel. I also want to thank uh, ZIOM and uh, UN Women for inviting Mexico to host uh, 
the parallel event this week. As the panel highlighted, the pandemic has raised important challenges when it comes to enjoying fundamental rights, especially for women and uh, migrant girls. Uh, we are threatened with going backwards in empowerment and gender equality. Therefore, when we look at responses to the pandemic and uh, recovery, both at national and international level, we include women fully as well as girls, regardless of their migratory condition and that they be provided with specific attention. Mexico has uh, made many, uh, taken many measures and I'll only share three with you. The first uh, is we, that we've strengthened the, the access of women and girls to healthcare and other basic services. This includes sexual health services as well as reproductive health services. Two, uh, we've given a maximum priority to uh, the emergence of uh, migrant women in difficult situations that were in civil society uh, centers so that they could have access to services. Our laws ban the arrest of migrant uh, girls, which is why they were always forwarded to civil society centers. And last uh, but not least, uh, we have designated as key activities over the period of the pandemic all those services dedicated to prevent uh, violence, and this includes gender and sexual violence. Uh, we also designated as an essential event all of that, all those services that provide refuge uh, so that women and girls weren't returned if they were in positions of danger. All these measures bear in mind the recommendations stemming from UN agencies and the Network on Migration and go towards the Global Pact on Migration that for Mexico represents a holistic roadmap in this uh, pandemic context. Uh, last but not least, Mexico has a very uh, feminist foreign policy. We want to empower women and girls, and w gender equality are cross-cutting priorities for us, uh, which is why we continue to work for the eradication of all uh, discrimination against women and girls, uh, especially bearing in mind the start of our action decade in which our actions will define our success in gender equality and the whole agenda 2030 as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mexico. Thanks for referring to the compact and amplifying the need to empower uh, women. I would like to go back to the Global Policy Insights, who has a second speaker online. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, fellow audience. I would like to express more on um, the uh, more on vulnerability that is caused as a result of the COVID-19 in refugee camps, um, purposely. Um, what happened is in many migrant refugee camps, economy and social life have been negatively impacted as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. And those who are involved in petty businesses, activities, migrant camp have diminished resulting from the lockdown, alcohol consumptions by men is on the high, and currently in some camps there were attempted suicide cases close to 21 reportedly in Palorino refugee settlement in Uganda. And this has actually resulted in a lot of domestic violence against women. Permit me, Mr. Speaker, to share some interventions that could help stakeholders to respond to this issue. And some also have actually been reportedly to be carried out in some camps. One of them is the creation of free mobile channel outlets to report cases of domestic violence. In camps like Palorino, where interventions like um, establish mobile channels where people can call on relevant stakeholders in the community to respond to issue of domestic violence has actually helped during this COVID-19 era. And also in some camps, there were reported interventions like trained anti-violence response units that consist of psychologists, a police officer, and traditional leaders who help to resultantly help to step down the domestic violence in some places where it has been reported. And on a long term, on the long term, the reported interventions would have helped with creation of women-friendly spaces that are actually restricted as well, and community sensitization, which have actually helped some current, these are current interventions that are happening in some camps now, and it has helped to reduce cases of domestic violence. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you very much for highlighting forced migration realities, um, such as in camp settings. Uh, I'd like to now give the floor to the International Federation of Medical Students, followed by ADAPT, Oxfam, and ILO. So, International Federation of Medical Students, not sure if you're here or if you're online. 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 Thank you, Madam Moderator. 
Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the International Federation of Medical Students Associations commends the efforts to facilitate a dialogue on the effects of COVID-19 uh, has on women and girls. While the whole world is rushing to fight the immediate threats of the pandemic, other important issues are fading into the background. As we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, gender disparities are being reinforced and the realization of gender equality and empowerment have stumbled in the time of crisis. It is established that women make up 70% of the health workforce, a big percentage of which represents migrant women. Yet women represent only 25% of the leadership positions. This has been reflected in the COVID-19 response as well, with women being the majority of the force at the front line of dealing with the pandemic. Despite that, a lack of accommodation to women's needs persists as policies fail to address the specific adversities women face in the pandemic, whether as part of the general population or, the, or as first responders. Women are at a greater risk, are at a greater exposure to the virus, while sexual and reproductive health services has, have also been undermined throughout the crisis. They are also highly susceptible to the pandemic resulting job insecurity, exploitation, and adverse socioeconomic impacts. In addition, women have also been subject to an alarming increase in violence and harassment. Having a migrant background only increases the burden as the effects of the pandemic are intensified and women face an additional set of challenges to bear. In the pre-pandemic normality, migrant women deal with aforementioned challenges on a normal basis. The IFMSA recognizes the vast contribution women have been making in the COVID-19 response, especially migrant women. The International Federation also re reaffirms the necessity of adopting a gender-sensitive and intersectional approach to the emergency response as key to ensure that the needs of women globally are met and that truly no one is left behind. The IFMSA emphasizes gender equality in times of pandemic and beyond, as it is a prerequisite to fulfilling the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which stipulates that everyone is entitled to human rights without distinction of any kind. Therefore, the International Federation of Medical Student Associations calls on all involved actors to ensure the adoption and implementation of, of inclusive policies that target the specific challenges which women and girls, especially migrants, face in the times of COVID-19. To ensure equal representation of women in key decision-making in all decision-making organs and leadership positions, and finally, to promote large-scale intersectional assessment of the health, healthcare, and socioeconomic needs and gaps, ensuring universal health coverage for all women and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for reminding us of the lack of women in leadership uh, uh, positions yet uh, being the bulk of the uh, health workforce. Um, let's move to the next speaker from ADAPT, followed by Oxfam and ILO. Adopt in the room. Thank you very much. Um, distinguished moderator, distinguished panelists and delegates, ADEPT, the Africa Europe Diaspora Development Platform, would like to thank IOM for organizing such an important event in circumstances that are particularly difficult. We rejoice the fact that migrant women are once again put under the spotlight. Women have played or I should say are playing, as the pandemic is not over, a major role in COVID-19 response and recovery. They often do so in the framework of their regular jobs, as many of them are COVID-19 frontliners, but not only. It is crucial to stress the fact that a large number of them went out of their way to assist those more or as vulnerable as them be it in their countries of residence or in their countries of origin. From food distribution in Belgium to mask production in Nigeria, from fundraising to finance personal protective equipment for Madagascar medical staff, to the creation of a help desk intended for migrants of Eritrean origin in the Netherlands, the action conducted by migrant women and migrants in general to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 have been manifold and deserve to be highlighted. This is what we in ADEP, and this is the reason why we in ADEP, we have decided to do and to conduct a media campaign aiming at showcasing stories of migrants, a majority of which are women that used 
their agency to help those in need. These stories prove that even in time of extraordinary uncertainty, migrants remain agents of change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, let's move to the next speaker of Oxfam. Not sure if Oxfam is we are on online. online. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Moderator and distinguished speakers and delegates. Even in developed countries, pandemics showcase us persisting inequalities between men and women. Women received the burden of homeschooling children, caring for household while working remotely and having employment insecurity. But we have to recognize that there was additional vulnerabilities that touched women migrants. Migrants, specifically women, often have had to navigate pandemic while working in businesses or branches deemed necessary. This put them at additional factor risks. During the pandemic, whether working in businesses or branches deemed necessary or not, migrants, especially women, were at risk to be laid off first. They also did not have the access to proper and stable health care. Often, sometimes when they tried to exercise it, they were faced not only by doctors, but also immigrant immigration officers. I am streaming right now from New York, United States. In the United States, migrants who seeked medical health care due to COVID were often approached in hospitals by ICE. My appeal is to all the states that are present or listen to us remotely. States should not be concerned by immigration status, but provide necessary health care, social services, and social coverage for all migrants, legal or illegal. This is specifically crucial to women migrants. Women migrants in regular conditions are vulnerable to employment instability and lack of crucial health care. We cannot allow for the pandemic to future deepen those patterns as it can lead to endangerment of their well-being and even their lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, um, the Speaker of uh, Oxfam. Start with you, please, in, in asking for maybe a five-minute maximum uh, reaction to comments from the floor or uh, questions? Um, I think for the amplification of women voices on uh, the ground in pandemic, it's very important to make sure that we have uh, either strong civil society or national women machineries linked to the ground to be able to take the um, listen to the women on the ground and take their messages to the decision maker. This link if it's not there, it's not only social media that, that will be amplifying their voices. It, it, the message uh, and their demands should be coming up to the decision maker and the policy maker. So when we're drafting the uh, the COVID-19 policy note, it we were listening to the women on the ground. What are their demands? What are their challenges? What they are afraid of or fear of? So listening is the core uh, uh, issue on amplifying the voices. We, we, they should not be talking and no one is listening. Second, awareness raising is extremely important and the real info, the right info, should be going to the women in all areas because a lot of rumors, a lot of misinformation, a lot of uh, uh, negative vibes are coming to the women and hence it's, it's becoming, uh, she's becoming more uh, vulnerable to the whole situation. So right and uh, 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 real information is, is extremely important for them uh, to respond as well. Psychological support <clears throat> in relation to domestic violence, psychological support to men and women is important. And at that time, we were offering the psychological support online. The, the, the talk, they, they need to talk, they need to uh, understand that confinement is really uh, putting a lot of pressure on both the, the father and the mother uh, in the house and also the children in the house. So it, it providing online psychological support might minimize the level of uh, domestic uh, violence uh, uh, at home. 
And the women should be aware on what hotlines, referral system, support system, uh, general prosecutors line, or uh, also national complaints officers uh, line, and child health line to be able to communicate immediately if there is a, a case uh, of violence. So the linkage between the psychological support and the referral and the, um, uh, the way of submission uh, of a complaint and also a, a quick response is a must. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for, your, um, for your comments uh, and uh, emphasizing the importance of the community the community-based approach. I would like to uh, turn to uh, Dr. Jakob. Would you like to take some of the questions and uh, provide your reflections following the reactions from the floor? Over. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, and I'd like to thank to all the representatives here in the room for this very rich discussion. And let me pick up on some of the issues from a WHO's perspective. Uh, first of all, women play a very crucial role in the societies, and this should be further strengthened. And they should play a very significant role in the rebuilding and in the new normal. And to make this happen, we need to give them more training, more education, strengthen their role in the societies, and particularly uh, put them into more and more leading positions. In order to make this happen, we need policy dialogues and policy decisions, and to make these policies evidence-based, we need more data and research. With regard to the policy dimensions and policy decisions, these have to be whole of government, whole of society approaches, because there are many intersectoral issues that need to be addressed. And I fully agree with those statements who underline the need to involve the parliamentarians in this process, governments together with parliaments, with local governments and with the NGOs together have a very important role to play, but they have to work together. And the Philippines referred to the joint statement that was launched yesterday, which is extremely powerful, also the code of code, and of course we have to fully implement it because it's not enough to launch it, it has to be implemented. Then the code of conduct for, conduct, code of, uh, of, uh, conduct for international recruitment and the year of nursing and midwives, which is this year, uh, are very important issues also to further strengthen the role of the women. But what I would like to underline also is that although there is some setback in economic terms during the COVID, and we all know, and it has hugely impacted the socioeconomic issues, but we should not give up on our dreams that we have captured in the SDGs, and the SDG agenda should go ahead, and therefore we need to bring now the pandemic to an end, and I will come back to that in a minute, uh, but at the same time we also have to work very strongly together on, our, um, on the implementation towards the SDG goals. The third issue I wanted to pick up is around violence. <clears throat> Clearly the lockdown <clears throat> and the COVID-19 have increased anxiety and depression, especially in, uh, in, in families at home during the lockdown time, which led to an increased use of substances different substances, including alcohol and, uh, and others. And this has led to a higher increase of violence and abuse. And one issue that I would like to flag up here is that these are all connected to mental health issues. And mental health has been, has been an area that has been far too much neglected in the past years and decades. So in the building back, we have to invest much more into mental health and how we have to, how we work together to promote mental health issues and together with the NCD agenda, we have to bring it to the forefront of our attention. Then looking, in moving forward and looking at the priorities, the most urgent issue is to bring the present pandemic to an end and we know what are the strategies that work, <clears throat> and we have to use <clears throat> these strategies to a maximum, like the public health measures, and I'm very happy to look around in this room and to see that you keep the physical distancing and everybody is wearing a mask, which is great. 
But then uh, once the um, uh, different tools like vaccines, therapeutics, and pharmaceutics and diagnostics are available, and you have to be aware that a huge amount of work is ongoing to develop these tools and to finalize research and development, and many of them are in the third clinical phase for testing, then our attention has to be on two issues. One is equitable access and fair allocation, and this is a policy that we are taking forward with many organizations in partnership and the member states. And, <clears throat> and the other one is, uh, is to make sure uh, that the, the health systems in the countries are ready to receive these tools and to roll them out. So this has to be a priority for all of us in the upcoming few months. And parallel to this, we were extremely concerned in the last couple of months that many of the essential services and public health programs have been disrupted in the countries, including immunization, including prevention and control of NCDs or infectious diseases or reproductive health services and, and similar. And now we have initiated a boost program uh, which works with the governments to restart these initiatives and activities. And here again, the role of the women is critical. And my final comment is about communication. The women have an important role to play in communication, particularly on issues like vaccine hesitancy, because the women as mothers, they want the best for their children. It is very difficult to convince those who are in the philosophically don't believe in the vaccinations, for example, but it is possible to gain the support of the women as mothers because they want the best for their children. So we have to use the women to the maximum in our communication messages. So this is from me, Jacqueline. Back to you. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks for underlining critical access to uh, COVID-19 tools and the importance of uh, communication and the role of women there, therein. Um, I just received a request from the floor from uh, Norway. Are you online or in the room? In the room. Hello. Sorry, I didn't see you. Thank you, Thank you Chair. And uh, I apologize for barging in as you are beginning to wrap up, but we had in fact hoped to be given the floor during the first round of, of statements. So I would just like to thank this panel for bringing so many perspectives into this dialogue and to share with you a few points on Norway's position to the response, the role of women in COVID-19 response and recovery. And we very much share the view that the response to this pandemic accentuates the 2030 agenda's imperative of leaving no one behind and our common goal to end all forms of discrimination of women and girls. And has, as has been very clearly highlighted by this panel, it is essential that we apply a gender perspective in our multilateral and our national responses to COVID-19. The pandemic affects men and women, boys and girls differently, and women must participate on an equal footing with men when needs and actions to combat the pandemic, as well as recovering from it, are defined. As we address the health aspects, we also need to focus on the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic. On Norway's initiative, the UN Secretary General has launched a multi-partner trust fund to assist developing countries in responding to the adverse socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. National measures and financial incentives must respond to women's particular needs, including those of migrant women their situation in the labor market, and their role in the community and the family. Education is a priority for Norway, and we were very encouraged, in fact, to hear from Egypt that girls were not dropping out in large numbers as schools reopen. We know that education for girls promotes gender equality, better health, and more inclusive economic growth. UNESCO tells us that more than 11 million girls are at risk of not returning to school this year. Norway is deeply concerned about how school closures are directly related to an increased risk of early pregnancies, early marriage, and sexual and gender-based violence. 
and we will continue working with our partners at country level to give girls and boys access to education. Closed schools and severe economic effects underscore how the pandemic could reverse the progress made over the last 20 years towards ending child labor. And Norway has therefore strengthened its efforts to combat child labor and other forms of modern slavery. We know that violence and harmful practices against women and girls increase in times of crisis. The UN expects that the pandemic will result in as many as 13 million child marriages between now and 10 years from now. Programs to prevent genital mutilation are being delayed due to the pandemic, and girls who are already affected by harmful practices are at risk of being further marginalized due to poorer access to healthcare and other services. Ensuring sexual and reproductive health and rights is a high priority for Norway, also in the context of the COVID-19. We therefore continue to fund efforts to abolish harmful customs, to protect against sexual and gender-based violence, and to provide access to sexual and reproductive health services in humanitarian crises. I thank you. Thank you very much, Government of Norway, and thanks for reminding us of the trust fund that also responds to the needs of migrant women and, and girls. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, can I now turn to you, Christine Noah, for some comments and answers and thoughts following the interventions from the floor? Right, Over. thank you very much. And I would like to thank um, um, all the interveners for these um, really very interesting different perspectives that you brought to this table or to this discussion. And I I'm, was really glad to hear Mexico, Philippines and, the, and Tunisia talking about the SDGs, because I think this is really, I mentioned earlier, the Beijing Declaration of Platform for Action, which is the overarching, or our overarching framework when it comes to policies um, for gender equality and um, women's empowerment. And of course, we are, the SG just launched the Decade of Action um, to accelerate efforts to reach, the, uh, to reach the SDGs and accelerate implementation of the 2030 Agenda, which is actually at risk. Um, and as Tunisia quite rightly said, what we're discussing here today is right to the heart of leaving no one behind because um, migrant women really are um, part of the groups of people, of persons, who are at risk of being left behind. So I really want to thank um, these delegations who, who brought us back to the essentials or the overarching, and at the same time, the overarching um, principles. Um, with regards to the questions, many things have been said and a lot has been answered already, but perhaps from you and women's perspective, um, just to quickly also um, mention about gender-based violence. Um, so we, Working on gender-based violence in general now in COVID, um, in times of COVID-19, but in particular also domestic violence, which is a very, very pressing and the concentrated space where we see this surge of violence. Perhaps I can just say that we are concentrating on a couple of points, which is on the first would be um, prevention and awareness raising. We have also heard that from Dr. Morsi that it's really important to make sure, and I think everyone is much, much more aware right now because there have been many um, awareness raising campaigns, including under the leadership of the Secretary General, um, which is actually continuing um, because there the are very concerning numbers, but it's not so clear yet how member states are actually in a position to um, address these, um, the, these, these raising numbers. And then, UN Women is engaged in um, supporting rapid assessments of, of domestic violence in different areas. And with regards to um, migrant workers, we have seen in the Asia Pacific region that um, women migrant workers who lost their job and are no longer able to support their family have been at particular risk um, of domestic violence. Then apart from that, we heard uh, it's, it's also access to essential services, including to helplines and shelters. There again, it's a huge challenge during these times um, since 
um, the, the women are locked in with the perpetrator of violence and controlled also um, communicating by phone, by other devices. It's very, very difficult. So this is also a target that we have to, to um, adapt and support organizations who provide these essential services to make sure that new lines are established, established or again that um, police and other um, enforcement um, um, authorities are really aware of these very specific challenges now we faced or increased challenges we faced because of COVID. Another point I would just like to address also in the context of, um, I think that was, it's also in the context of the SDGs in general and zooming into migrant uh, migrant workers, the, the ambassador of the Philippines has mentioned this. So the whole question of social protection mechanisms, but also the stimulus packages to make sure that they properly serve the women and girls um, who, um, the women and girls who live in the countries where the stimulus packages are being um, mounted. And there again, um, we have also, um, we are, have also been active in, in four areas, working together with women um, owned um, enterprises in, in all countries, but then also focusing on economic um, areas which or, or sectors which are very much impacted by COVID um, areas that are employing many, many women, like tourism and hospitality. We haven't talked about this today. But then also training courses for women who own companies to train them how they can actually access the stimulus packages, because then that's the other thing. Either the stimulus packages is gender responsive, or if it isn't, um, to make sure that um, women know how to access these funds. And to close, I would just like to echo what has been said by um, my co-speakers. A key point for all women, but also for migrant women, is really to have them at the table as we redefine, redesign the way we want to live and the way policies are um, should be shaped um, when we go when, when we go on with life. Hopefully, in a time after COVID, and there again to have the, the migrant women at the table. Um, in bringing their experience to the decision shaping and the decision um, making. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for these excellent um, closing remarks uh, from you and women. Um, we have, I think, two minutes left, so I will definitely not summarize this whole session. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, a panel and of course, Excellencies, distinguished de delegates in the room, you have been absolutely astonishing uh, this morning. I think this was an excellent session. We went over a host of vulnerabilities that we have to look into, from exclusion to social protection, exploitation, mm -hmm. violence, poverty, discrimination, um, and so on. And I really want to pause with the enormous attention that went to Violence, violence, and uh, mental, the need for uh, emphasis, emphasizing uh, mental health. Um, it's very sobering, actually, that we have to talk about violence today, but uh, in this context, but uh, uh, very good that this was highlighted. Then we heard so much about the contributions, not uh, migrant women and uh, only as healthcare workers, but well beyond, and the con their contributions to socioeconomic development in general. Um, clearly, COVID-19 amplifies inequalities and vulnerabilities. Everybody said so. But what we also heard is that this dramatic crisis is offering us opportunities, all of us. We heard from member states, UN, civil society and others about multidisciplinary, intergovernmental efforts. We heard about community-based approaches. We hold for calls for innovation, data, addressing the structural obstacles for migrant women and girls. We heard calls for solidarity. Um, and all of this against the background of UHC, of development goals in general, of many resolutions, uh, global health and migration platforms and agendas. It seems that the development and political platforms are in place, but it is for us to really now do the right thing that was mentioned by uh, some of us. Um, 
I know that we have to stop the session because, and this is going into what you just said, Christina, we have to hear the migrant stories. We have to also have the migrants at the table. So the next session will actually focus on that. I will close the session by uh, saying um, nobody is safe until everybody is safe and leave no migrant women and girls behind. Thank you very much.